Hello and welcome. My name's Rose Ballister. I'm Chair of the Faculty of English at the University of Oxford and I'm a Professor of English Literature. It's my privilege to introduce you to our visiting Professor of Creative Media for 2021. We'll have time for questions at the end of today's lecture, so please send through your questions on the feed and we'll gather them to discuss as many as possible. I'll say a little about the history and purpose of the lectures and about our speaker before I hand over the screen to her. This is the first of two lectures. Professor Zing Zeng will deliver a second lecture in this series on the 22nd of October, 2021. We hope this will be in person, although it'll also be live streamed and recorded so that it can be widely shared. And we also hope it will provide an opportunity for her to meet and work with students in the English faculty with interest in pursuing careers in media and journalism. The English faculty also benefits from an annual internship program for students with News UK publications that sadly has had to be paused over last summer and this due to pandemic restrictions. The post of visiting Professor of Creative Media was established in 1996. And our lecturer today joins a distinguished list of speakers who've addressed topics as varied as screenwriting, sports and radio journalism, news reporting, directing and producing in film and television, and the histories of media and media industries. These public lectures are designed to spur fresh debates about communications and contemporary media, new angles and reportage, particularly from the world of practice and production. And there could be no better or more urgent time to speak to the transformation of media and information through the internet and what was on its invention in 1990 termed the World Wide Web. It's not only transformed our media, but also, of course, the ways we do and communicate our scholarship in universities. This ancient university of Oxford is often associated with the codex, with paper and with manuscript. However, it's always been knowledge rather than its platforms that is at the heart of our work. Part of that pursuit of knowledge has been the exploration of how new platforms and technologies can provide different affordances for our knowing. Attention to media, culture and representation is central to the scholarship of many of us in the English faculty, but also in other subjects and fields in Oxford. It's timely to host this lecture in the 20th year that the Oxford Internet Institute has been in existence. And more recently, the Humanities Division at Oxford launched in February 2021, its Institute for Ethics in AI. So I want to welcome today students and scholars at this talk, not only from English language and literature, but from many different disciplines, interdisciplines and new disciplines, as well as our colleagues and friends in the media. And equally welcome, of course, are members of the public to whom we can extend through such affordances their access to the scholarship and debates that we pursue here. And I think we can have no better person to speak to us about these issues than Zing Zeng. Zing Zeng has been since 2015 the executive editor of publishing company Vice UK. Launched in 1994, Vice has offices in 35 cities across the globe. Vice Media creates over 2,400 pieces of content a week in 25 languages. Zing Zeng's profile and pointed contributions are especially striking among that content. She's an author, journalist, documentary host, and podcaster. She specializes in women's and LGBTQ plus rights, politics, culture, and lifestyle. She took a BA from Cambridge in Social and Political Sciences in 2010 and an MA in Magazine Journalism from City University in 2012. She was previously UK editor for Broadly, Vice's digital platform for women, and UK chief editor at digital media platform for youth, Convini, and a news editor at Days. She writes, she speaks, she talks, she walks and stands on many platforms, print and virtual, visual and verbal. And she's always a passionate advocate and activist, as well as a principled investigator. In 2018, she published a critically acclaimed nonfiction book series titled Forgotten Women. This is a four book series that dives into the lost histories of accomplished women, scientists, artists, leaders and writers. Personally, I especially enjoyed her podcast of Spring 2020, United Zingdom, where she travels around Britain with her producer Viv Jones asking what is it like to be British? Traveling with Zing Zeng is always a surprise. It's a rich treat. Sometimes it's a challenge. And I'm sure it will be today too. 
So Professor Zing Zeng's first lecture explores how the line between offline and online life has collapsed and the implications, opportunities and challenges that has for journalists. His title is Everything is Online Now, How the Internet Blurred Fact and Fiction. Just a reminder, before I hand over to keep sending in your questions on the feed as you listen, welcome Zing, I'm delighted to hand over to you to deliver your first lecture. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me at Oxford virtually, of course. Um, and thank you to the English faculty for inviting me to give this lecture and Roz for that, frankly, incredibly embarrassingly effusive introduction. Thank you so much. And if you're watching or listening right now, thank you for joining me for what I hope you'll find is an interesting and hopefully enlightening talk on digital journalism, the internet, and the ways in which they intersect uh, interact and in some ways enter into strange new relationships, which I think we should talk about. Um, let me just screen share you with you my presentation right now. And we can get started in a sec. Lovely. So we begin and I have to admit, I was a little surprised when Oxford approached me to give this lecture. So I have the honor, or maybe honor is not exactly the right word here, of being one of their youngest visiting professors of creative media and one of the first people of color. And I found this out by Googling every other person who's previously occupied this post, which is very millennial of me. Um, but I think Oxford may have anticipated this slightly by approaching me for this post, hoping that I would shed a little light on journalism and media from the perspective of someone who entered it, not in the heyday of Condé Nast corporate accounts or four hour lunches of sources at the Groucho, but in the abysmal trenches of the post 2008 financial crash. And if you're a student watching right now, I hope I can provide an illuminating and hopefully not too depressing picture of what it's like to be a relatively young person working in the media. So like Ross said, I graduated from City in 2012 with a master's degree in magazine journalism. And I've worked on three magazines, but mainly in the then ascendant field of what is called digital journalism. So let me set the scene for you. Instagram had only launched two years earlier and we were all using those awful filters that made everything look like it was in sepia and it had just been bought by Facebook for a staggering one billion dollars a then unthinkable amount of cash. Snapchat was only a year old and just a few prior months to my graduation Twitter had begun to curate results on its timeline and Google by the way had also just rewritten its terms of service adding the rights for Google to use host and store any content submitted by its users. Now there's often a mantra in journalism that social media has made society worse and is actively hostile towards the mission of journalism to educate, enlighten, entertain, and hold the powerful to account. Um, it's an idea and it's one that's been mentioned in previous lectures that social media has amplified our desire to cater to the worst and lowest common denominator, that it's privileged the shouty voices of a few and that it's dumbed down society and stopped us from being able to communicate or concentrate on information in any depth. Funnily enough, this is also criticism that has historically been lobbied against the media. But for a taste of the contemporary anti-social media brigade, here is male columnist, and famous contrarian Peter Hitchens on social media from 2020. And he's saying, this is correct. Social media are a training ground for thought police cadets and in a physiale meter biter. Now, if you, I've probably pronounced it wrong, but if you don't know what in a physiale meter biter means, don't worry. I also did not know that. I had to look it up. It basically means a Stasi informant. Now, I don't want to dwell on the substance of his comment because they are a dime a dozen and ironically can also be found all over social media. But I'd like to point your attention to the fact that he's responding to a tweet that is no longer available on Twitter, because if you click through to that, it will have come from an account that has been suspended by the company. So what is Peter Hitchens replying to? You can only really find that out if you look up an archived URL of the tweet on the website, like the Wayback Machine which is a website that tries to archive all online content for digital posterity. It's kind of like a library of the internet. 
So when you do that, you can find this tweet from someone called Veronica M, which says, Clark Micah, that's Peter Hitchens, has had a mob going after him since before lockdown because he did every single day because he dared oppose it. But for all intents and purposes, for the majority of people who don't know how to look up old tweets on websites like the Wayback Machine, the original comment has evaporated. And the context for what Peter Hitchens is saying has been left in the dust. Now, I don't know who Veronica M is, and Peter Hitchens and I disagree on a lot, a lot of things. But this is a good example of the extent to which our conversations and discourse are determined by technology companies like Twitter and Facebook. They have the power to not only give us a platform, but they also have the power to take this away, leaving us shouting confusingly, much like Hitchens is doing here, into the void. Now, for all we know, he might be agreeing with outrageous sentiments like anybody who uses social media should be rounded up and shot, or Mark Zuckerberg is secretly a Marxist plant bent on destabilizing the wider society. But without Veronica's tweet, with Twitter having deleted it, we'll never know. And the power to determine whether that tweet exists lies largely in Twitter's hands. Now, technology companies don't work like newspapers or any other publication. They don't have an editorial ethos or an editorial mission. I mean, some publications don't either, but that's a story for another lecture. Instead, they have what they call corporate social responsibility and user agreements. And at the end of the day, Technology companies work like every other corporation. They work to make their shareholders rich. Now, many media companies may operate in the same way, but I like to think that at least us journalists have the grace to be a little bit angry and resentful and embarrassed about it. So here's a clip from Succession about exactly how that relationship between powerful shareholders and journalists can function at their very worst. In this clip, Kendall, who plays the family scion of this enormously powerful, rich family called the Roys, makes a very dramatic entrance to address a very online new media company that he's just bought. It's a very dramatic entrance, I should say. Okay, guys, everybody, if I can just have a second. I just wanted to update you on a couple of developments. Uh, some of you may have noticed servers are down and we're setting a satellite office on seven. And I'm afraid I have to inform you, you are all dismissed. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're all fired. So if you can leave your laptops where they are and hand in your passes, security will be coming around now. Been through everything you've shown me, food and weed. Those are the only two verticals driving revenue. So we're folding them in and uh, yeah, you're all free to leave. This is a joke. You have 15 minutes to gather your belongings and exit the building. Separation agreements will be handed around shortly. One week of severance per year served. With full non-disclosure, post your little videos, you get three days. Unused vacation days will not be reimbursed. Health benefits will be terminated at the end of the month. That's it. I'd like to thank you all for your work. You piece of shit! I should have asked Oxford if I could have played swearing in this lecture, but it's happened now and we're all going to have to deal with it. Um, I don't think you can show that clip to any digital journalists, whether they're in the UK or the US, and not see a shiver run down their spine. Uh, Succession is a great show. It's great if you want to have a look into the way the rich and the powerful operate. And it also produced this great tweet about the possible inspiration for Volta, the company that you've just seen Kendall destroy. Is Volta on Succession supposed to be Vice, the weed vertical reference, BuzzFeed, 
Five reasons why drinking milk on the toilet is kind of a game changer. This is a fake headline that Volta ran in the show. And all Goka, blatantly hostile relationship between staffers and corporate overlords. And as you can see, uh, the 58, 55.8% of respondents have just replied, we're all in hell. To be a digital journalist, especially working in 2021, I think you kind of have to have a sense of humor that's darker than Satan's armpit if you want to keep your sanity. So up until the last few decades of the 20th century, most newspapers and magazines did not have this thing called digital journalism. In fact, they were simply pumped out by humble printing presses and did not exist on something called the internet. In fact, some of them even owned their own presses. Northcliffe House, which still houses the Mail, the Evening Standard, the Eye, and the Independent in Kensington, even had its own printing press in the basement. Here's a picture of what was called the Woods Press at Northcliffe House, which is now on display at the National Science Museum. Now, the appeal of owning a printing press is straightforward. You get to control the number of papers going out, you get to decide where they go, you get to introduce new technology, although in the case of the whopping dispute of the 80s, where print unions went on strike in order to protest modern computing methods, this doesn't happen without significant protest, but generally you get to run your own ship. So what happens when publications grow increasingly reliant on technology companies to disseminate their content, to act as a kind of mediator between them and the audience, where before there was only newsprint? So this is not a revolutionary conclusion by any means, but it was not great. When I studied for my master's, we were assigned a neighborhood in London. It was called a patch or a beat as it's known in America. And we were told to cover it. So this meant that every week I would traipse around Eastern looking for stories. We attended council meetings, hung around overflowing bins and visited local pubs to try and extract news from very confused residents and very deeply annoyed local council officials. So this is all common practice in journalism school. The stories you tell will never be truly front page stuff, but it does help you get better at basic skills, talking to strangers, sniffing out stories, and understanding even on a very micro level how news happens. But the one thing we were told repeatedly, to my confusion, is that we were not allowed to use the internet, and especially not social media. This was, we were told by our university tutors, cheating. So imagine our surprise when my cohort graduated and entered the workforce only to find that almost all of the content we produced was beholden to the internet in ways that we had never thought possible or been trained for. Here's one example. One of my peers from university worked on the equivalent of an SEO farm. Now, ostensibly, it was a celebrity women's publication that you would almost certainly recognize on the newsstands. But for months as a graduate, she would sit and create photo gallery after photo gallery of different celebrity women based on SEO trends. And many of them turned out to be downright dubious. Now, if you don't know what SEO stands for, it means search engine optimization, and it is the bane of many online publishers. This is what Authority Labs, a software company, defines it as. You use tools to figure out the phrases people look for in Google. Popular ones are known as keywords or search terms. You produce content about that. Then you flag up to Google what you've written about by repeating the search terms in the headline, URL, copy, and in the picture tags, which are a bit like invisible hashtags that identify images. If you ever wonder why some publications love running online articles that simply proceed along a systematic list of questions, SEO is what's happening. Publications like The Sun run these as Sun Explainers, and then a whole host of publishers, including places like Newsweek, hire SEO reporters, whose job is to pump out these kind of stories. Now, many of these people are young, relatively new to journalism, and thrilled to work at big name publications that lead the news agenda. But they very quickly find out that being an SEO reporter leans heavily on the SEO and less on the reporting. So here's what an article like that might look like. They'll divide each article up into subheaders, all of which are questions that someone might type out of curiosity into Google. Let's take the first one that you see on screen. What is Conan O'Brien's net worth? The next question in section would be, is Conan O'Brien leaving late night television? 
that the next one after that might be, is Conan O'Brien married? And then who is Conan O'Brien's wife? The idea behind all of this is that hopefully the Google gods will lap up this offering of easily indexable and understandable data and push your article further up the Google rankings. And if you hit that first page of Google results, you have hit the jackpot. You then ruthlessly cling onto that top spot by regularly updating that article with new information, ensuring a regular stream of traffic to your site, traffic that you can then monetize through advertising. Now, this all might sound very innocuous, and there are good examples of SEO out there. Because after all, the world is a very confusing place, and people do appreciate straight to the point explainers making sense of what's going on. And after all, journalism is meant to provide people with information and inform them, right? But there is a dark side to SEO, and you won't be surprised to know that people Google a ton of very disturbing things when they think no one is looking. And the problem is, obviously, that Google is always looking. So let me give you an example. Let's look up Miley Cyrus on Google Trends. Now, Google Trends, if you're not familiar with it, provides a rough gauge of what people have been Googling since 2004. Not exact statistics, but enough to tell patterns and trends. So here we are entering Miley Cyrus music into Google Trends, because after all, that is her job. She is a musician. So we've got a healthy number of people Googling it over time. But now let's try something a bit more salacious, like Miley Cyrus nude. And immediately you see that there are far more people in the world Googling nude photos or videos or content of Miley Cyrus than they are interested in looking at her music. And now let's try Miley Cyrus album, just to make sure we've got this right. Again, Miley Cyrus nude far outstrips Miley Cyrus album and music as a search term. Now let's see what happens if we type in Miley Cyrus naked. There you go. More people are Googling Miley Cyrus nude and Miley Cyrus naked than there are people interested in finding out about her music or her album. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, Miley does do topless photo shoots and, you know, she does wear a lot of skimpy clothing. To which I say, you know, that sounds a lot like, dear Google, she was asking for it. But for the sake of argument, let's look at another highly search engine trafficked female celebrity who isn't Miley Cyrus, Emma Watson. So when you type in Emma Watson, movie into Google Trends, you see that there's a healthy number of people Googling her, which makes sense because that is her profession. She is an actress. Now let's see what happens for Emma Watson naked. So far more people are interested in trying to look up naked photos or content of Emma Watson than they are interested in her actual job as an actress. But let's try Emma Watson actress just to confirm it. Even fewer people are interested in learning about Emma Watson, the actress on Google. Now let's see what happens if you type in Emma Watson nude. And there you go. Again, as with Miley Cyrus, Emma Watson naked and Emma Watson nude show up far more. And if you look at this spike in May 2004, where it spikes in the green for the first time, do you know how old she was back in 2004? In 2004, Emma Watson was 14 years old. This is what my friend realized when she was working at that publication that shall remain nameless. She was writing caption after caption on photo galleries that ran on a publication ostensibly for women. But in reality, they were targeting any old pervert who was looking to satisfy their urges on Google. And you can see this in action on any number of publications. So here's what comes up when you Google nip slips. As you can see, the top three results all cater for women. And the second top ranking is 17, a magazine supposedly for teenage girls, although they've cannily disguised many of these articles as empowering AF. Although I bet you a tenor that none of these articles were promoted on social media. They were just uploaded to the site and left to gather traffic. Now, once you learn to spot these tricks, 
you can see them everywhere. Guess which SEO terms these publications were trying to cram into the copy as subtly or not so subtly as possible. If you guessed uncensored wardrobe malfunctions, you'd be right. That's one of the classic search terms. And in some cases, pandering to the SEO gods produces downright ghoulish results if you're not careful. When celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain and fashion designer Kate Spade both died by suicide in 2018, Newsweek received a ton of criticism for its headlines on a series of SEO optimized articles. These include, who is Anthony Bourdain's ex-wife, Otavia Busia, chef dead at 61. They later changed this headline, by the way, to restaurant business brought together Anthony Bourdain and ex-wife Otavia Busia. Who was Kate Spade's husband, Andy Spade, designer found dead in New York. And then we have Kate Spade net worth, massively successful designer dies at 55. Now, I don't want to single out Newsweek because everyone does it. So many publishers ran headlines like this when Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade passed away. And every single publisher out there uses SEO to try to serve their content to more audiences with varying degrees of sensitivity. But Newsweek were just the publication that got pulled up the most for it. Writing in The Verge, Bijan Stevens says, such optimized coverage tends towards uncomfortably direct because it reveals people's private desires. Google won't judge you for wanting to know how much money Bourdain left behind. If no one's staring at your shoulder over, as you type, what you enter into a search bar feels private. It's only in aggregate that these clicks become, that what we're looking for becomes unsettling. And it's only in aggregate that publishers and advertisers take notice. Those clicks come from your parents, your boss, your high school friends, your college friends, your grandparents, your accountant, your neighbor, the regulars at the bar and the bartender herself. It's all of us. One click is a tragedy, but a million is a profitable statistic. The question then is about how to balance audiences' prurient curiosity for morbid, potentially insensitive, and sometimes downright invasive detail with journalistic responsibility. But I also think they serve another purpose. They introduce the idea that audiences deserve to know this information in a certain framing, privacy be damned. Firstly, that is perfectly normal to want to know how people die by suicide, something that mental health charities like the Samaritans, which you need counsel against. And if you're listening very carefully, this is also why I didn't want to read out the line in Stevens's piece about Kate Spade's suicide. Secondly, that it's good to know how their loved ones feel about it in as much detail as possible, and that we get to know how much these loved ones stand to inherit. In other words, these are things that you would never ever want framed in a series of straight to the point questions if your loved one died by suicide. Now, there's an ongoing debate about whether SEO is still relevant to publishers, whether we, we traded the brutally quantifiable hit of traffic goals for ones around impact and influence. But the pull towards search traffic, especially when you know how to do it well, can lead publishers down some very dark ethical avenues. And once you start, there's an echo chamber effect. You get the hits, which justifies the stories, and then you're trapped in a cycle of feeding the beast and audiences begin to hunger for this content. Everything in those Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain articles is fact, but the line between fact and fiction, do audiences really want this content? This is what you crave, this is what your publication is about, grows blurrier and blurrier. And now, as it turns out, technology companies are not so great at navigating this line either. Time and time again, we've seen hoaxes and lies go viral on social media. You'll probably know about the proliferation of fake news on Facebook in the run up to the 2018 2016 US presidential election. As Craig Silverman reports for BuzzFeed, in the, in the final three months of the US presidential campaign, the top performing fake election news on Facebook generated more engagement than stories from major news outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, NBC News, and others. You can see some of the most shared items of fake news stories here, including one in which, shockingly and improbably, Pope Francis shocks the world and endorses Donald Trump for president, releases a statement. But you'll find this kind of misinformation, misinformation happening 
on new forms of social media too. So here's just a few examples from 2021 alone. A national rape day hoax on TikTok that caused widespread panic that rapists had designated a special day for assaulting women and girls. COVID misinformation being spread on Clubhouse, the audio only social app that has no in-house moderation. And finally, on a more lighthearted note, Tom Cruise joining TikTok and playing golf, which turned out to be a deep fake from a visual effects artist and a Tom Cruise impersonator. Now let's take a look at this because to me, this really, really does show how we're at the precipice of some very frightening blurring of fact and fiction indeed. In this reel, you're gonna see my amigo, Chris Umi. <laughs> He's gonna to introduce to you the wonderful world of deep fakes, how AI and VFX are unlocking the future of our imagination. <laughs> What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? I think there's bubble gum in chocolate. Mm. That's incredible. Incre How come nobody ever told me there's bubble gum? Incredible. Oh, yeah. It's quite scary stuff, isn't it? Now, prior to the 2016 election, Mark Zuckerberg's stance was that Facebook was not a publisher. But facing the wrath of legislators, however, he's now looking to rebuild that relationship with the media. Even if that does result in some very cheesy photo ops, like the one he did with his wife Priscilla outside the office of a local newspaper. Isn't it cute? You'd never guess this man was partly responsible for leeching advertising off the media industry for years. But publishers aren't off the hook either. What I've seen in the last 10 years of digital journalism is an increasing reliance on social media to generate stories. In short, exactly the kind of thing my journalism tutors warned against. Often, it'll be younger and less experienced journalists, ones at the start of their career, saddled with these responsibilities, because there'll be an implicit assumption that they get the platforms because they're digital natives. And in many cases, this is true. But it places an enormous onus on these journalists to get it right. The internet is swimming with the deception and they, like every other journalist, are hard up against deadlines. Now, one of the most lighthearted examples of this is the Scottish comedian Limmy, who will tweet the same placeholder text when a celebrity dies, which is, I had the pleasure of meeting X at a charity do once. He was surprisingly down to earth and very funny. One of them even made it onto Sky News when Peter Stringfellow died, which you can see here from celebrities and from members of the public as well. One here from Limmy, who said, I had the pleasure of meeting Peter Stringfellow at a charity do. He was very down to earth and very funny, Peter Stringfellow, uh, who died in the early hours. But there's also a dark side to this. It's all too easy to manipulate by nefarious actors. Take the Internet Research Agency, a St. Petersburg-based organization with ties to Vladimir Putin. Now, Twitter has identified dozens of accounts linked to the Internet Research Agency, many of which have successfully insinuated themselves into online discourse. So well, in fact, that they have been quoted in several respectable mainstream news outlets. According to a University of Wisconsin, Madison, according to a University of Wisconsin, Madison, into a study into the phenomenon, and they refer to the Internet Research Agency as the IRA, just so you're not referring to just so you know they're not referring to something else entirely. 
we searched the content of 33 major American news outlets for references to the 100 most retweeted accounts among those Twitter identified as controlled by the RIA. From the beginning of 2015 through September 2017, we found at least one tweet from an IRA account embedded in 32 of the 33 outlets, a total of 116 articles, including an articles published by institutions of long-standing reputations like the Washington Post, NPR, and the Detroit Free Press, as well as in more recent digitally native outlets such as BuzzFeed, Salon, and Mike. The outlet without IRA linked tweets was Vice, which, you know, I can take no credit for because there but for the grace of God go I. Now, in many of these cases, these tweets were used to illustrate public feeling. You know, they functioned as the equivalent of a virtual vox pop. But unlike a vox pop on broadcast media or one done in person by a print journalist, you can't ask follow-up questions or use your journalistic instinct to discern whether or not the person right in front of you is telling a bare-faced lie. All you can do is rely on the limited information you can glean from someone's social media profile and hope they're not saying something because they're trolling, faking it, exaggerating for comic relief or irony, spreading Russian propaganda or simply doing it for the lows. And that is a lot of ifs. And then there's cases where journalists have mistakenly written off internet phenomena as marginal unimportant events that have few real world consequences. The most obvious instance of this is Gamergate, an online mob of people in the gaming community who began harassing, doxing, and threatening feminist women in the industry, including journalists. Now, at the time, many publications struggled to take Gamergate seriously or wrote it off as a short-lived fad, something that I'd argue was inherently motivated by misogyny and sexism just as much as Gamergate itself was, given the number of women who experienced incredible levels of harassment. This is what Vox journalist Adria Romano wrote about her experience of covering Gamergate. As it was happening, many members of the media were quick to dismiss it. Sparked by a single blog post published in August 2014, Gamergate was still in full swing when an editor asked me, as a reporter who covered it from the very beginning, to write a recap of it near the end of that year. The editor wanted a piece that framed the entire event in the past tense, even though the hashtag was still going strong, the women it targeted were still being harassed, and supporters were planning offline actions to take place at upcoming geek conventions. Soon after I recapped it, other publications wrote about Gamergate as if it were more or less over too. One writer predicted that 2015 would be the year everyone forgot about Gamergate, noting that it's still around as a Twitter hashtag and a forum topic, but its relevance is, is waning from its peak into fall. That's going to keep happening. Spoiler alert, it didn't. Gamergate mainly organized over what was seen as niche internet forums like Aikun, formerly 8chan, and 4chan, platforms that later became the springboard for rabid far-right conspiracy theories like Pizzagate and QAnon, which then became responsible for fueling the events on January 6, 2021, the storming of Capitol Hill. This is what Brianna Wu, one of the original targets of this online hate campaign, said in the wake of the insurrection. Everything I tried to get the FBI to act on in the aftermath of Gamergate has now come true. We told people that if social media companies like Facebook and Reddit did not tighten their policies about these communities of organized hate, that we were going to see a violent insurrection in the United States. We told people these communities were organizing online for violence and extremism. That, unfortunately, has proven to be true. And she set, goes on to say that she worries that recent moves in tech platforms to limit the amount of hate in organizing are too little, too late. In fact, one niche internet forum, Parler, which marketed itself as a right-wing alternative to Twitter, was a hotbed for insurrectionist organizing and boasting. These are screen grabs obtained by Bellingcat, a publication that specializes in open source journalism and the nonprofit Coalition for a Safer Web. One user writes something about a message to Republican traitors, which ends with them telling everyone that they know what the penalty for being a traitor is, it's death. Another user says, thanks someone for informing him about carrying firearms at the insurrection. 
he's going to run two Glocks concealed. A Glock is a firearm, by the way, which is illegal to carry in Washington, DC. Now, here's another user replying, saying that he'd rather pick up guns as he carries on. I'll pass on felony. If weapons are needed, easier to just take what you need as you go. In fact, political analyst Aria Kovler, who has studied pro-Trump messaging boards, tweeted all the way back in December about the possibility of a violent insurrection at the Capitol. Let's take a look at what this latter-day Nostradamus said on December 21st, two weeks before the riot. On January 6th, armed Trumpist militias will be rallying in DC at Trump's orders. It's highly likely that they'll try to storm the Capitol after it certifies Joe Biden's win. I don't think this is sunk in yet. These people are angry at the Democrats. They're angry at the GOP for not suspending democracy. They hate the media and many consider police to be the enemy, even as they fly the blue lives flag instead of the stars and stripes. He tweeted this in December 21st, 2020. Now, in fact, many experts said that the writing had been on the wall for anybody to see for weeks. People have been openly organizing and swapping tits for the insurrection on a number of internet forums and social media platforms, including Twitter. Now, the irony, of course, is that QAnon itself is hoax and misinformation of the highest order. The HBO documentary from this year, Into the Storm, reportedly unmasked Q himself the shadowy figure allegedly at the center of government responsible for leaking claims, which are false, about a satanic cabal of pedophile cannibals who, among other things, trafficked children and defrauded Trump out of his White House win. And as you can see him for yourself, the man himself, Ron Watkins, doesn't seem to take it all half as seriously as his followers. Ron hadn't just been participating in Q research. It sounded like he was leading it. Yeah, so thinking back on it, like uh, it's basically, it was basically three years of intelligence training, teaching normies how to do intelligence work. It's basically what I was doing anonymously before, but never as Q. See that smile? Ron had slipped up. He knew it, and I knew it. And after three tireless years of cat and mouse, well, <laughs> never, never as cute. I promise. Never as cute. Because okay. I am not cute. <clears throat> I never was. Now, to be sure, many publications covered the rise of Game of Game and QAnon. And especially after the events at the Capitol, there's much more interest in covering internet culture. But too often, journalists, especially in the UK, are missing out on huge stories and shifts in society and culture because of a misplaced idea that what happens on the internet stays on, stays on the internet. This is to ignore a massive sea change in the way that people, especially younger people, receive and communicate information from communities and influence change. Consider, for instance, the recent GameStop saga in which amateur investors banded together on a subreddit called Wall Street Bets. A subreddit is a community forum hosted by Reddit. And they put the squeeze on established traders to send the value of a failing video game re retailer called GameStop sky high. Here are some of my favorite GameStop memes. The S&P 500, by the way, is a stock market index of 500 of the largest companies listed on US stock exchanges. Now, you can understand why many on Wall Street, the professionals, quote unquote, may have reacted with panic or disbelief when they saw what was happening with GameStop. It's very hard to take your competition seriously when they're nihilistically celebrating losing money and calling it stonks rather than stocks. And there are so many of these stories out there waiting to be uncovered. But journalism, technology companies, and the internet have, as I've previously covered, a pretty rocky history. All too often, social media is used to reinforce what we think we already know to be true. Hence, the shocking success rate of the Internet Research Agency in infiltrating mainstream media. It's viewed as this addendum to the story rather than the story itself. 
But if the, game, if the capital insurrection put paid to the idea that whatever happens online stays online, then GameStop well and truly ended it. What publishers need to get better at is discerning the line between fact and fiction on the internet, between what's a story and what isn't, between who's a Russian bot sowing discord and who isn't. Now, ironically, the journalists best place to do this are the young digital natives who live and breathe these platforms and pick up on its syntax and cultural nuance in a way that a 58 year old news editor can only hope to do. They're probably also the ones best placed to create guidelines around how journalists can rigorously verify social media posts and users. But they're also the ones most likely to be saddled with the grunt work of digital journalism, tasked with the thankless job of SEO reporting and writing up clickbait. If you've ever read a clickbait story like this insert name of public figure gets absolutely destroyed by this insert name of other public figure and lamented the downfall of modern journalism, rest assured it will have been written by a young journalist who like you is lamenting the downfall of modern journalism. If they're lucky, they'll be asked to scrape social media for trending stories written up in the hope of attracting a few stray clicks. And I know because I, was, I did this as a young journalist too. And let me tell you, it is thankless work knowing that your success lives and dies by social media algorithms and AI that is kept deliberately opaque and unknowable by tech companies. Not least when these tech companies feed us outright lies, including the notorious pivot to video, where Facebook over-exaggerated the success of videos posted to its platform. The outrageous figures prompted many publishers, including Mashable, MTV News, Mike, Fox, and my own company, Vice, to lay off journalists in an attempt to create more video content. But when the advertising dollars failed to materialize, companies then had to engage in even more redundancies. And according to The Atlantic, 350 people from 2016 to 2018 were laid off in the US partly due to Facebook's misdirection, compounding an already shrinking industry. Now, if editors had any sense at all, they would be turning young people into the internet and tech reporters of tomorrow not the minions forced to work down the Google mines pumping out trending news and SEO clickbait. And if these tech companies had any sense at all, they would be approaching journalists far more to find out how to cope with a huge problem of misinformation and fake news. Now, at this point, many people would now be looking misty-eyed towards the era of journalism where Facebook was just a hot or not rating system for Harvard grads and Twitter was just a cutesy name for birdsong. But I think we are too far gone for that. Like it or not, we are never going to be able to get rid of social media. We're going to have to live with it. Fortunately, the events of the past few years have thrown this all into flux. More than ever, we understand now that the internet is real life. It determines what we do, who we interact with, and to an unnerving degree, what we think about things. And our reliance on it has only exponentially increased during lockdown when there was little else to do but be online. In April 2020, Ofcom found that UK adults are spending more than a quarter of their waking life online, with one in three now watching online video rather than traditional TV, with two in five making video themselves. And I'm going to highlight that last fact because I think it's something that points towards a very interesting phenomenon that publishers are only just beginning to grapple with, two in five making videos themselves. In a 2009 lecture, Yes, this is all the way back in 2009. The internet theorist Clay Shirky says that one of the biggest changes wrought by the internet is how consumers can now also be producers. Every time a new consumer joins this media landscape, a new producer joins it as well, because the same equipment, phones, computers, lets you consume and produce. It's as if when you bought a book, they threw in a printing press for free. It's like if you had a phone that could turn into a radio if you press the right buttons. This means that publishers aren't just competing against other news outlets. They're also competing with pretty much anyone who can pick up a phone and disseminate information in an engaging way. And these people aren't beholden to Ofcom, Ipso, or any regulator, let alone lofty ideas about democracy or freedom of the press. And this includes people like Jake Paul, a 24-year-old YouTuber with 20.4 million subscribers, who said in an interview recently that COVID cases are at less than 1%, and I think the disease is a hoax. And trust me, everyone wants to get into editorial right now. Even the YouTube influencer Zoella has turned her brand into a publication. In fact, this was an article they published yesterday on the local elections. Now, 
what Shirky has pinpointed is also what's propelling the misinformation that I've mentioned on TikTok and Clubhouse. Thanks to technology and the internet, anybody can simply pick up their phone, hop on a trending topic or hashtag, and contribute in their own small way to the spread of hoaxes and misinformation. In the case of TikTok's National Rape Day, it resulted in this. Now, whether that's unintentional or motivated by a desire to educate and spread awareness or intentional out of a desire to acquire views, clout, or simply feel part of the crowd, people are doing it. And it's not hard to think about how wrongly or badly the case in Southampton might have gone. But without journalists who investigated these claims of a national rape day, which turned out to be completely unfounded, hoaxes like this would still be allowed to proliferate. And during coronavirus, it would have been impossible for the public to receive accurate information about the unfolding crisis without the work of journalists, including investigations that exposed government mistakes and cronyism and held it to account. Now, during this lecture, I've tried to complicate the truism that holds that social media is the enemy of good journalism. I've also tried to explain that social media and the internet itself is actually the place where much of our lives now unfold and where huge sea changes in culture and behavior can first be detected. These have huge ramifications on our politics and our society, and not just that, but journalists ourselves, and the journalism that we produce. Increasingly, they are becoming fertile ground for our competition public figures and influencers who don't have to pay heed to the truth or editorial ideals, but who are sucking up audiences who might have once depended on journalists to know what was going on in the world. But all too often, we've approached the problems posed by the internet in the wrong way, because we've attempted to please tech companies by sacrificing editorial sensitivity and rigor, because we sense that our advertising dollars are increasingly dependent on their whims. And we've done this at the expense of young journalists we should be supporting and nurturing for their understanding of our new digitally connected world and training them up to take our profession to the 21st century. Some argue that the key to surviving is riding off the increasing scrutiny of government regulators of companies like Facebook and demanding that these companies invest in journalism. In fact, in February, Facebook announced that it would invest $1 billion in news over the next three years, a figure also matched by Google. But I'm not so sure this is the answer, especially if we don't yet know who the money is going to, whether it's journalists and newsrooms themselves or execs and shareholders. But if nothing else, the rise of new social media platforms and the spread of misinformation shows that, that we still need journalism more than ever. We need to nurture this new generation of journalists who are able to tell which way the wind is blowing, both online and offline. And it's my hope that hopefully a few of them will be listening to this lecture right now. Thank you very much. I'll take questions now. Hello, Zing. Um, do you think you can perhaps take down your... Um, there we go, then we can see each other. I'm afraid I'm not... Uh, I, I have to stand in for those people who I hope are sending, gonna send those questions to you um, because of the technology we're using. Thank you so much uh, for that lecture, which is rich in information and its own in investigation. Um, and you set us some really interesting challenges. I have one question to start with, which I think is, is one that lots of us will be thinking. Um, so uh, Nikki asks, um, do you think this is a long term issue or do you think the lifespan of these issues will be shortened as people become more aware? So is this a you know, is this an intractable and ongoing problem or, or do you think it's something that as the more aware we become? I think, well, I mean, the issue of, does she mean the issue of publishers not quite paying enough attention to what's going on online and being able to discern the difference between misinformation and fakery? Um, the question came in, um, I think as you were talking about not being, as we were looking at um, not Tom Cruise, actually. Yeah. <laughs> So I more mean, about not public is a good way of putting it. Um, I think it's going to get worse. It's going to get much worse, especially with deep fakes. Um, the technology is accelerating frighteningly quickly. And, you know, I really hope this doesn't happen, but I feel like we are going to come into a situation eventually where this is going to be used 
against women and people of color in really insidious, horrible ways. It's not so far beyond the realm of possibility that someone could produce a deep fake of a woman and use it to blackmail her. You know, I'd be surprised if that actually hasn't happened already. Um, and I think as the technology advances, um, we're going to come across more and more instances of this, you know? Let's say, imagine you are a uh, young woman who wants to run for politics. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that someone could create a deep fake of you to discredit you. Uh, I think that there's a lot of stuff going on now that happens to young women, especially when it comes to revenge porn that is intrinsically linked to the rise of technology. And we've only yet started to deal with this. So uh, some of you listening might have remembered the Everyone's Invited Instagram page, which was uh, disseminating these accounts of sexual violence and rape culture in schools in the UK. And so many of them had to deal with technology, you know, upskirting, people passing around videos, uh, not just passing around videos, but being able to disseminate them widely across entire neighborhoods, across different schools. That's the result of technology. And I think that technology companies need to do a lot better with reckoning with the kind of power they've unleashed. But I think all too often, they've kind of just regarded innovation as a good in itself without stopping to ask themselves, what about the responsibility that comes with that? Mm. Yes, I agree. I, I, I don't know. The, I mean, what, another answer to, to the to that example that you've just given us would be to say, what's, there are all, people might also want to say, well, what's the authenticity of that witness or the evidence or the testimony that we hear hmm. uh, on social media? This <laughs> means so that there's, I, I think the larger question I wanted to ask you is one about um, <laughs> what's the meaning of the term journalist now? Hmm. I was very struck by the end of your talk when you were sort of saying, you know, so um, we need to pay more attention, we need to uh, bring on younger journalism, get, journalists, give them those opportunities to, um, um, if you like, expose because they're so immersed in that culture. But then I want to ask, are they journalists? Is that, do you see, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the, I think the, that term as something that has some salvation guess, with it. So I guess one of the things that I've learned working as an editor at Vice who frequently commissions, you know, Gen Z people, um, is that, you know, the journalistic impulse to take one step away from the story and be able to report on it as an objective bystander never goes away. You know, it, it's it, it's across generations, you know, Gen Z have it just as much as millennials, just as much as Gen X or, you know, all the other generations. And I think that, you know, there are plenty of young people who are watching, you know, the spread of misinformation and hoax, hoaxes on social media who are looking at, you know, TikTok influencers, um, the rise of SponCon, um, you know, forex traders kind of manipulating people into joining multi-level marketing schemes you know these are all things that are happening right now and they're happening mainly on the internet and i think there are lots of young people who are looking at it and thinking i want to cover it i want to write about it um i want to like be able to present a documentary about it and i think you know that impulse is kind of evergreen really it doesn't really go away does it need does that impulse though need to be attached to a publisher or an industry or is a journalist if you like, an autonomous, could found a, their own platforms. So my, I'm sort of thinking about, is it a profession any longer? <laughs> you know, uh, is it right. a form of action? Or, um, I think I think it's still a profession. Like, I definitely think so. I think in the UK especially, because the institutions of the press and are so kind of entrenched, is that a lot of people still see themselves wanting to join a publication, wanting to join a publisher. And also there's, you know, the matter of, you know, job security as well, you know, which is not something you ever grow out of wanting, um, even if you're Gen Z. Um, so I think that it still exists as a profession, definitely. But I think there's lots of interesting cases, especially in, you know, the UK with publications like Gaudem and Black Ballad, where it's journalism motivated by an absence of, seeing those needs met from their community in the ma mainstream media and wanting to go at it alone. And I think that's a very typically Gen Z trait, wanting to do it alone because you see there's a need for it. Yes, I'm sure that's right. Um, I have a question from Isabel who asks, um, how do we work out a balance between uh, SEO bringing in visitors and the bad side of it? So I think that there are publications that do SEO really well. I think the Washington Post does it extremely well. Um, and I think it's about kind of figuring out as a publication, 
you know, what is the best way to reach audiences, but kind of blunt the hard edge of an SEO um, article, because, you know, SEO is a very, very blunt tool. And that's why, you know, you read these articles and you think, oh, that's, you know, straight in there with the net worth, straight in there with whether they're divorced. Um, And I think it's about kind of understanding that people want to know this information, but they might not necessarily want to know it in such a straight kind of down the line Wikipedia style way. And, you know, even Wikipedia writes up articles in a way that doesn't feel entirely SEO friendly. You know, they tell a narrative, they tell a story. I mean, I think you can easily apply that to SEO articles, but at the end of the day, it is a skill, it's a writing ability. But I also think that too often it's kind of passed on to younger journalists, you know, oh, just do this thing, you know, write enough of it and we'll put you on a proper story. But I think that it needs to be, those journalists need to be trained and made to understand, you know, this is how you write an SEO story. That doesn't feel insensitive or a bit too blunt or rude. And, you know, we see this as part of being a journalist alongside allowing you to report on things you actually care about. You yourself get involved in in teaching journalism. I was thinking about your description of your example of learning um, and being told to avoid social media and not use the Internet. I mean, are you aware that that's is that changing in? um, I hope so. Um, When when I went to City, we had a single module on digital journalism and that was it. Um, which I think we had to build a website and also create a Facebook page. Um, And that was kind of it for online journalism and digital journalism. Like if I could rewrite the syllabus, um, I would make it, you know, an entire, I would make it an entire course. Basically you could, you would have to have a module on how to deal with targeted harassment, doxing, online security. You'd have to have a module on, you know, social media responsibility and ethics. You'd have to have another module on, you know, kind of open source journalism of the type that Bellingcat is doing. You could make an entire degree about it, really. But I think that when I went to university, it was very much seen as a peripheral thing. Mm-hmm. Alexander has a question. I'm, he says, I'm drawn too to thinking about use of bots. Bots via deep learning algorithms can become producers of text. I was wondering what your thoughts are on this development in the horizon. Oh, so I think if I'm not mistaken, he's talking about kind of bots generating journalistic articles, which yeah. actually I think the Guardian has published a few before. Um, if I remember correctly, one of the first articles that was published by a bot was one about an earthquake happening somewhere. And it was, you know, it was just a straight kind of 250 word news piece. An earthquake happened here. The magnitude was X, et cetera, et cetera. Which when you look at it, you're like, well, actually, yeah, it makes sense that Bob could do this. It's very systematic information laid out. Um, what I think is going to happen is maybe, I mean, this is this is going quite far, quite far off into the future, because I think that, you know, maybe we're not quite at the point where a bot could write an entire newspaper because a bot still can't pick up the phone and it can't quite send convincing emails, although I think that's kind of not far off. Um, but, you know, like I think that inherently creative me- media is creative and you do need to be in a to work with people to do it. There's a lot of kind of human skills and empathy skills that you need to display, which I think that bots currently kind of lack. So while they might be good for writing up stories like an earthquake happening, I don't think they could write a 2000 word profile of an actor in GQ yet. I had another question. I I think sometimes there's an attitude that um, the journalists are are sort of uh, fair game as you said it's their job to investigate um and I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that sort of sense of I suppose I would take my own sense as well of, of women's nervousness about putting making themselves visible to see just only putting themselves yep. into positions yep. where they become vulnerable to that kind of harassment and what that means for the future of journalism as well in terms of um women's think, engagement with it I think it's a real issue and you know I've been trolled um I think recently I was sent some quite racist memes mm. uh which I found actually found quite funny because they were so bad they weren't they weren't even very good memes at all um and I think it is a real problem especially if you're a woman or a person of color or someone from you know a marginalized group I mean it's really hard enough to get into journalism if you're you know not your typical kind of middle-aged white guy um so I think it is a real problem and I think the issue with that is really that, you know, 
tech companies need to understand that this is part and parcel of them having to support journalism. So, you know, Facebook and Google are saying, we'll throw $1 billion into supporting journalism. Well, then one of the biggest ways you can support journalism is making sure journalists don't get harassed off Twitter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see that it's a strange announcement, isn't it? We're, we're putting this money in with no sense of where it's going or yeah. what yeah. the priorities are. Yeah, I mean, are they going to do a Facebook daily newspaper for your local area? I don't mm. It's very mystifying. So I'm, I'd be very interested to see what the developments with that are. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a follow up um, from Alexander, but just, yeah. Um, maybe in addition about live coverage becoming policed by bots, how DMCA could be already enforced on Twitch by silencing in bods the audio when copyright infringement is suspected. Um, I mean, yeah, so I actually, so I also feel like Alexander actually might be much more knowledgeable about this from the tone of his questions. I'm sensing that he's an Oxford scholar into AI, but I mean, from my understanding of AI, I think, you know, copyright infringement is a huge issue. And also it prevents a lot of creativity. So, you know, like you have YouTube streams that are getting taken down because, you know, a bot senses that they're using a snippet from a Kanye song that Kanye does not want license to be used by just about anyone on YouTube. And then it takes it down completely. And I think that is kind of in opposition to the essential character of the internet. So, you know, I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, the internet's just a terrible, horrible, toxic place. But on the positive side of it, it is a very creative place. And it very often lends itself to remixing and reinterpretation. You know, you'll have, I remember back when I was a university student, the biggest thing you could hear in a club was a mashup, which was basically like five different songs played all together um, mashed into a single mix. Um, and, you know, it's that kind of creativity that you get on place on platforms like YouTube, on SoundCloud, places like that, that I think are an increasing risk from these kind of bots that are just going to bluntly, infr- bluntly kind of enforce copyright law. Um, and I think it's, you know, anathema to creativity itself, really. Mm. I have a, a, one more question I wanted to ask myself, which is it's more of a kind of, I think it's a literary critic's question, I suppose. There's this question about what is the distinction between fact and fiction? Is, mm-hmm. Are we already sort of propagating a fiction and thinking there was a time when there was fact and fiction and that they've got blurred? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that in fact, something, storytelling is, a, um, is what we all deal in and we, and we, and we all understand that um, story um, is, is, can tell you truth without necessarily um, carrying fact with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I'm wondering about the extent to which the interrogation of, of the authenticity or the fact that lies behind a question, behind a story, is something that is really going to survive or whether actually what the internet is teaching us it I think is to be yeah is, is, is something different from that about fiction I think that's that's kind of one of the impulses behind spreading misinformation um on platforms like TikTok so I couldn't go into this in very much detail in the lecture itself I mean I find this a really fascinating case I commissioned a really good piece on Vice about it because I'm so I'm really fascinated about how this happened but with the National Rape Day hoax um what you got was hundreds and hundreds of people making videos warning women to stay clear of men and protect themselves and you know carry knives and you know there's one video that's literally like you know we should just shoot all the rapists really really like incendiary stuff and I think that a lot of people jumped onto that because it confirms a lot of our very worst suspicions about what life is like for women you know that it is scary and unsafe and frightening and you know it can be um but the appeal of that story was much more compelling than the idea that, oh, you know, maybe we should look behind this hashtag and find out what the real video original, the real original video actually was calling for. Does the real original video even exist at all? And it turned out, you know, TikTok said it didn't. Um, And I think that that's what happens when misinformation spreads. It's like, not everyone is doing it to kind of troll or lie or because they're evil or whatever it's because sometimes the story it's telling us about our society is so much more compelling than the factual uh evidence there is for that story to exist yeah yes i think that's a really important point and, uh, and along with that i think goes that um comment you made about a, a language of safety that we're always as though there, if we could just arrive at a position of everyone feeling safe we would have 
that would be the fight and that would be our end game as I wonder whether we actually whether safety is should be the priority so much as the capacity um, mm. to investigate to inquire to question Mm. There's actually a really good book out coming out from an Oxford scholar um, about it called The Right to Sex, which interrogates this very notion about safety and women's safety, you know. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think the sad fact is um, there's no such thing as a place of perfect safety in the world. Um, and much of what we want to achieve, well, I mean, you know, politically for me as a feminist is safety for as many people as possible. Um without trying to give up, without being at the expense of too many other people. Um, so I think that what, what's happening with National Rape Day is this idea that you can create this place of perfect safety and that if you enough of you band together, you can make it happen. Um, and unfortunately, because people have so many varying ideas on how to enforce that and deal with that safety, you end up with you know shocking events like schoolgirls carrying knives because they think it will protect them. Mm -hmm. I think we should draw our discussion to a close. Um, if anybody wants to put anything to on a feed um, before I do that, I will welcome it or I'll keep my eye. But otherwise, um, I'm going to say I think it's probably an appropriate um, time to end tonight. Um, and thank you so much for a lecture, um, which I think opened up um, a really important question for us um, about our own sense of responsibility, for the ways that we manage and respond to the information that we receive um, and that shared responsibility um, uh, when we engage um, with online information. Um, so I'll thank you so much, Singh. Um, for, for your lecture and I want to thank everyone else who's been involved in making tonight possible um, including Torch for supporting the English faculty um, in making this event as accessible as possible. Um, I want to thank all the viewers at home as well for watching and for all your wonderful comments and questions. Um, recordings of this and the following lecture will be available on Torch's website and will also um, the recording will also join the audio and visual recordings and transcripts of previous lectures from our visiting professors of creative media. They're free to access on the Oxford English faculty website. Um, so thank you uh, once again. Um, we look forward to all of you joining us uh, with Zing, whether online or in person, for our second lecture on October the 22nd.